Hi, this is CC Kim. And this is Jim Bacho. And this is Movies About Music. This time around, we are going to talk about The Fabulous Baker Boys. Which is your suggestion. Yes. And an excellent one. Oh, I have to say, you. this is a quintessential movie, movie about, about music. music. It yes, really agree. is. Yeah. But mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you, because you've been very torn about this Sex in the City thing. I, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm not, I, I don't, I never watched an episode of right. Sex in the City. I knew it was a big show. I knew it was Sarah Jessica Parker. And that's about it. But apparently this is a very important deal for a lot of people. And I know you've been watching this. I have a very intensely studied relationship with Sex and the City because I've read Candace Bushnell extensively. I've read the original book and I've read all of her novels. And I have read her most recent book, which is titled, Is There Still Sex in the City? I kind of grew up with it. It was also a very New York specific show and this environment, these characters and these references in this show, even though I was young, I sort of understood. And so it was very entertaining for me. It was also a bonding experience with all my friends. And like, I feel very nostalgic towards the show and the world, the setting of this show, which was 1998 to 2004. It was a very different world. And just like that, the revival of Sex in the City came out. I was deeply upset at this show, not because of any of the choices that they had made, but because I felt this deep nostalgia towards that time when it aired. It was just like, there's so many things that had changed since then. These women are older, I'm older, and the world has changed dramatically. Some things are gone forever. I was really looking forward to living in the world that they had lived in back in like 1998. Mm -hmm. But I'm living in a very different world. And I don't, oh man, I didn't want this. Specifically, I am talking about the technology that we have become so reliant on. And um, the pandemic, obviously, the pandemic that has made us become more reliant on this technology, on said technology. And the experiences that I no longer get to have. And and I was just like, I'm not done with these experiences, the tactile experience. Same, same with me. All of those experiences have been sort of prematurely taken away from me. I wasn't ready to let it, let it go. Well, it's the mobile technology mm-hmm. for one. That's just one of the factors, I mm-hmm. think. When you finished the second episode, you said to me, I want to go back to 1998. And I said, yes, I do too. Yeah, there were several things that really reminded me of how things used to be. But I was too young to enjoy these things back then. Yeah. I'm not a smoker anymore, but people were always smoking indoors mm-hmm. back then. And I remember that being really fun. Mm-hmm. And I'm not in, I'm in no way advocating for this to come back. I know that it's very health hazardous and, you know, whatever. So I'm bringing this up because I totally took up smoking because of the fabulous Baker Boys. <laughs> I, I guarantee you that it was one of the movies where I thought, That woman looks so cool. Every time she's having an emotional crisis, she lights up a cigarette. Not just a cigarette, but a... Paris Opal. There you go. So I had seen this movie when it came out. Yeah. Or maybe maybe I saw it on... I don't know. This is 1989. The only thing I remembered before we started watching it is I thought Bo Bridges' character, Frank, Mm -hmm. was just a whiny bitch. Right, right. I did too. I think, yeah. I see him differently now. Totally. But that was my thought at the time. This is also when Jeff Bridges, who is Jack, 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 I think Jack. This is when he was really emerging as a star. Mm, I could see him becoming a star after this. This is post-Tron. I think his stardom came kind of late, didn't it? But he was know. always in a movie. He was yeah, always in a I movie. Yeah, I remember that too. Yeah. But this was a this was a fairly big film, I remember, when it came out. And I just want to jump the gun and say that I think this is a fantastic film. Mm-hmm. There's too. lots yeah. of layers going on in this film that my 20-year-old self couldn't possibly have understood. Of course, I've got the experience of playing music now, so do you. You know, when I was 20, I think I'd probably done my first actual 
gig. Mm-hmm. I think when my first gig was with a band called The Fuse, mm. which is a terrible name for a band. By the time I saw this movie, I was a different person than I am now. Okay. And I've seen a lot more, obviously, having experiences playing music. Oh, totally. I mean, I when I first saw this movie, I was like eight or something. I ca- when it came out, I was like six years old. Yeah. And then um, I by the time I saw this movie, I think I saw it when it came out on VHS and my parents rented it from Blockbuster. Okay. Yeah, that's so specific. That's probably what happened because we would go to Blockbuster after we went to the grocery store mm-hmm. and they would rent out something for themselves and I would rent out something for oh, myself. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, we used to do that like with videos. Yeah, we would have remember? one, we would have two movies. Mm-hmm. We would always rent two movies at Blockbuster. Mm-hmm. And it was one for one and one for the other. Yes, Whether exactly. it's kids and parents or... Exactly. Yeah, I think for us it was the yeah, same, yeah. kids and parents. And so, um, but then I always ended up watching their movies. Um, right. If it was not, you know, sexually charged or anything. And this movie was like not that sexually charged i mean it was you know it did have like a little bit of i don't know man it's pretty sexually charged yeah but as a child you don't notice what's going on i did not get anything about the dynamic all i knew was that i wanted to be Susie diamond so it's about two piano players called the fabulous baker boys right they're brothers they're brothers and they've been playing piano gigs for like what 30 years or something did Mm -hmm. they said they started 31 years yeah they started very young so they're not like really old guys or anything but they started Mm -hmm. very young and they had been playing together for a really long time and then at one point they decide we need to get a singer because the gigs were dwindling right Mm -hmm. and they were having a hard time making ends meet and so they audition a bunch of singers and michelle pfeiffer's character Susie diamond comes along and she has a wonderful voice and obviously she's michelle pfeiffer so she's one of the best looking people in the history of (laughs) <laughs> well, before that, yeah. we had to go through the montage of bad singers, yes. right? And, you know, this is like what movies do. Yeah. You go through the montage uh-huh. of the different singers. And the first one was Jennifer Tilly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so in amazing. apparently her breakout role, um, we snuck a little Wikipedia on that because mm-hmm. I couldn't remember Jennifer Tilly and Meg Tilly. I was mm-hmm. thinking of Meg Tilly, who stole the show in the movie The Big Chill, but this is Jennifer Tilly, her sister. But yeah, then we get to Michelle Pfeiffer and right. she kills it. And then they start playing together as a trio they are much more successful as a trio this is michelle pfeiffer's first gig as a singer as a musician because before she says that she was an escort before this right but she has a natural talent they do very well with her and then a bunch of things happen but they have like artistic disagreements um disagreements about how to approach things and her and jack i guess sleep together a couple of times and there's some weirdness and then the, the band splits up Frank blames Jack and whatever, and Jack is like, you know, being all aloof and whatever. And then Susie Diamond leaves the band for (laughs) another music gig. Okay, so this is when I turn to you (laughs) because uh, this is towards the end of the movie. And she starts, she she got a gig to do some TV work. And she starts singing this song about carrots and And peas. peas. And I turned to you and I poked you and you're like, what? And I said, this is you. Yeah. I I grew up to be Susie Diamond. Yes. Yeah. And it was really weird because I was like, I realized, oh my God, I had the exact same life trajectory. (laughs) Well, except for the escort, right? (laughs) Well, obviously. And uh, and I'm also not one of the best looking people on the planet. Oh Oh, my God. No, no, no. Michelle Pfeiffer in this movie, you guys, uh, this was pre- Batman Begins. Uh, so she was like not yet Catwoman, but she was already looking, starting to look like Catwoman. The the Selena Kyle look that Michelle Pfeiffer had for like a decade. She was when she was younger, like Scarface. Michelle Pfeiffer yeah. was cute and very lovely, obviously, like Age of Innocence and all that. But then there was this one decade, and I think it was starting from this movie, where she looked like a really sexy cat. <laughs> Well, there's also like, oh, well, she's just like, oh my God, yeah. gorgeous. The um, facial sem- symmetry and just the proportions and the allure of her eyes and her lips, it was just crazy. And I was Real just like, lips. Yeah. Not sex in the exactly. city lips. <laughs> yes. Michelle Pfeiffer was also, not only is she gorgeous, but this was this was a, also a period of time like she did Lady Hawk. Mm. And she was stunning in that. You oh, saw yeah. that movie, but fell asleep. I was so, I so wanted you to see this favorite movie of mine with the terrible soundtrack. And then you fell asleep. Well, I was very tired. But anyway, yeah. So she, and she's, 
luminous in that movie. Yeah, she's just fantastic. She's a she's a complete movie star. So is Bo Bridges. Um, oh yeah. Or sorry, Jeff Bridges. Jeff Bridges. Yeah. We got to keep them separate. Uh, Jeff Bridges. Again, he was an emerging star at this mm-hmm. point, and you can see it. And I really gravitated to his subtleties. Oh, yeah. He was like that disgruntled. Oh, my God. He was perfect in this role. But in the audition period, we were talking about the audition period. Yeah. The acting is so refined by Jeff Bridges yes. in that scene. I don't know if you noticed this. But, you know, she starts singing and mm-hmm. he's got this facial expression. Mm-hmm. And then there's the realization that she can play, but he's not going to look at her. Mm-hmm. But his face changes a little yeah. bit. And then she hits a note. And then it's almost like the process in his mind is, I can jam with this girl. Yeah, yeah. There's, I can connect with this totally. singer. And, you know, we all know that feeling, right? It's beautifully shot. You know, it's just a close-up of him. You cut to her, who's trying to do her performance. You cut to Bo Bridges, who also realizes this can work. But he's thinking dollars and cents. Mm-hmm. And he has a dollars and cents expression on his face. Jeff Bridges has an artist expression on his face, a musician's expression on his face. And we come to find that this is the dynamic that plays out in the movie. The reason why I'm saying this is a fantastic film about music, but just a fantastic film anyway, Mm -hmm. is the relationship of these three people in that way. Because what develops in the plot are these thousands of undercurrents that we could talk about. Being an artist versus being a performer Mm -hmm. versus doing this for your job versus what did you give up to do Mm -hmm. this versus what about the personal relationships? This is two brothers And she comes and she doesn't necessarily come, she doesn't come between them, I don't think. Mm -mm. Not in a direct way, but she emerges in a non-manic pixie dream girl way Mm -hmm. to rupture the situation that they had not talked about. Right, right, right. So I I totally agree. And it all plays out on Jeff Bridges' face. And Mm -hmm. you can just see him emerging as a star in this movie. I'd have to look at his Wikipedia or whatever to see exactly what came before and came after. But this is him, I think, at a high point. Yeah, it was wonderful. He was the most believable actor, I dare say. I mean, this might be hyperbole again, but it, it was he was the most believable actor as a jazz piano player. He was. And that we, I've ever seen in anywhere, like in any movie. Yeah, I don't know if he plays. We saw his hands move, and I don't know if he studied to do that, but the hand moves weren't perfect, but it was convincing. It, it wasn't just that he looked like he was playing for real, but I just know so many piano players like that. They're severely disappointed by life <laughs> and the world. They're passionate about music, but they just put up this guard and it looks like they are extremely dispassionate about everything else. I had a flash of a thought while I was watching the movie and I don't know what I'm going to say next, but I did think about Whiplash. Oh, totally. Me too. And I know exactly what I want to say. Okay, good. It's interesting. We were thinking the same thing, but we just, we did a podcast a month ago on Whiplash where there's the idea of I'm going to be a genius Uh And fuck everybody who gets in my way. And we both hated it. Mm -hmm. It's not that he's a grown up version of that little piece of shit. Mm -hmm. Because he's a different person. He has his piece of shit elements as well. Yeah, totally. But he's he's not a grown up version of that same person. Unless that kid, that drummer, has gone through a lot of experiences Mm -hmm. in his life to kind of season him. But the thing is, Jack in this movie and the drummer in Whiplash are completely different in that Jack has a passion for playing. Mm -hmm. And his brother, the family aspect, kind of takes it away from him, takes the artistry away from him in order for them to be successful in business. I don't know if he takes it away from him. I have come to realize that Frank's way of loving music and his approach to playing music to make a living is also a form of love for music and a passion for music. I think I have come to that point where I realize how hard that is to do and what it takes to make such a sacrifice. Okay, so I agree with you. But I think that we also have to account for the fact that Jack, I think, is at another level. He is an artist. Susie tells him or she sees him play and she sees the passion on his face and she says i think you're really good or something Mm -hmm. like that yeah and he says you know like thanks she's like no i think you're really good and she's the one who kind of does this rupture that i'm talking about he's at a different level he's he's at that real jazz musician level totally where he's committed himself and he's really good and we could throw out the word genius if we want to 
where he's got an extreme sensitivity for the art of music. And I think that Frank doesn't have that. That doesn't mean he doesn't enjoy music, but there are these levels with totally. music. I don't think um, Jack is a genius and Frank is not. I, I don't think it's a level issue. I, I think do. they are both diff- I think they are different types of musicians. So the indication that Jack is better than Frank in any way, I think comes in practically, it comes in two ways. Jack can play by ear, whereas Frank cannot. Well, remember as well that he has a weird brain. He remembers details, right. he remembers numbers, yes. he remembers dates. Yes. He also so there's a scene in a actual jazz club with an actual jazz band that has that was a very good jazz band like a real uh, the music the performance music yeah. in this in this yeah. movie was great it was quality jazz music and he was jamming with them and playing a very realistically good piano solo so i think totally i think jack was is if he could if he wanted to pursue it he could probably maybe go and become a jazz musician. And a very good one. Yeah. But he becomes tied to his brother. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. So I think his brother is like a lodestone. I see what you think. That's kind of weighing him down. And I do think that there is a painting of the idea of genius without beating you over the head with it. Mm-hmm. So this brings me back to Whiplash, mm-hmm. which is beating you over the head with the idea of wanting to be something that you're never going to be if you don't have joy for it. Well, the problem that I had with Whiplash was that they were beating us over the head, the audience. They were totally. beating the audience and saying, this is what a genius goes through. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas this is a more realistic portrayal exactly. of what an actual jazz musician might have gone through. Yes. Yeah. And he's understated. He's he's He doesn't talk a lot. Mm-hmm. He's just not a character who's going to talk about his greatness in even an, obl- an oblique way. Right, right. He's, he's just going to do it, mm-hmm. right? And he does it. And she sees it. And this is, by the way, this is a total male fantasy mm-hmm. fulfillment, mm-hmm. which is I'm really good at what I do and I want a woman to see me do it. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. And then we have yeah. that scene, yeah. you know. So <laughs> I just want to point that out. I thought that was interesting as well. But I think that whiplash is a perverted idea of genius because it doesn't have the passion, commitment, and love. Maybe it has the commitment, mm-hmm. but it doesn't have the passion and the love mm-hmm. that this movie does. Right. He's obviously supremely gifted and not everybody can be that. Right. And that is a lesson, I think, you know, in a more current time such as ours, mm-hmm. that I think people don't understand. You can't just manifest something by by playing single stroke roles in your bedroom. Right. Yeah. There has to be exactly. something yeah, already yeah. Yeah. and you have to have a love for it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And a lot of times it's not even hard work that gets you there. And especially something like jazz, being a jazz piano player, that's something that's so complex and so subtle and like only very few people will even notice that you're even doing it well. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing, that's the most realistic part aspect of this movie was that he's a very good artist. He has this artistry. He's a good jazz pianist that is not on the same level as his brother, but people don't know that. Most people don't mm. recognize any of that shit. You know, you could be a lot better than the person that you're working with, Mm -hmm. but most people will see you as like the same because they don't know the difference. Yeah. And I think that's the thing where when they're performing, I do think that Jack kind of knows somewhere in him. And again, it's just such a beautiful performance. There's real pathos in him. Mm -hmm. You don't know what he's thinking. He's very, again, he's very quiet. But I think he knows probably that he's better. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. But he's doing this out of commitment. That's what I mean by commitment oh, to his okay. brother. Yeah, yeah. And then she comes and interrupts that. You know, it's interesting. I think I, I turned to you mm-hmm. <laughs> at the end of the movie and I said, oh, that feels like the end of act two. Mm-hmm. And then it ended. Yeah. Um, so we don't know where these characters go. Right. But I thought it was I thought it was an OK end. I thought I, I thought it was OK. Yeah. yeah. I guess we didn't see the success that hopefully Jack had and she had. I think that there might not have been any success. OK. You know? Excellent point. Yeah. OK. Good. Good point. Yeah. Touche. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like I said, I know so many of these Jack people who never really had tremendous success. Yeah, there's probably, it's for those musicians out there who I think have to do this, Mm -hmm. what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And and I don't even mean to demean it. It's not, it's just that it's a good job and you have real talent. Mm -hmm. But again, I think he's that higher state Mm -hmm. of artist that he could have gone his whole life doing. Right. And maybe it's better that we don't see him go to that next level of 
being great because maybe he becomes Jaco Pastores, you know, where he becomes an alcoholic and it winds up dead right. on the street or something, you know, like we just don't know. Maybe it's best not to know those things. I think the thing with the film is he, through her, he came to realize who he is again, which is typically a manic pixie dream girl mm. trope, but I don't think it was that in this. I think, I don't know. What did you think? I mean, it was definitely a manic pixie dream girl trope kind of thing, except that okay. these three separate characters I think all had their own stories that were story like character arcs that were strong enough for me to ignore the manic pixie dream girl aspect. Okay. I think I think thing. that's that's good. She saying. had her own arc. Maybe I was maybe identifying a little bit too much because I ended up a jingle singer mm -hmm. and I did, I did all those gigs, the New Year's Eve gigs, the Christmas gifts and mm -hmm. I I I, had, I never had to sing feelings, but you know I've That's right. That's one songs. of the things in the yeah. movie that she's like, I don't want to sing feelings mm -hmm. again. And yeah. Frank is like, we got to do this song. The crowd loves it. Okay. So then Bo Bridges character a little bit. Frank. Yeah. He's the businessman. Mm -hmm. He's the older brother. He is going to do everything to make sure the machine is operating. Mm -hmm. He's He comes across as a whiny ass. Mm -hmm. But again, we were talking about Paul McCartney two weeks ago. And Paul McCartney had to be that guy, mm -hmm. right? to be the kind of I don't come think on we should, guys i don't think we should compare frank with paul Com just McCartney. in that one way yeah, okay, just okay. in that way obviously we can't compare those two because i think that frank was basically a manager mm -hmm, but yeah. you know like paul had to be a manager for the beatles yeah, at that point yeah, in time because yeah. they didn't have one but my point being that you know this is a movie about really what music is like mm -hmm. when you're a performer mm -hmm. you have to take that shitty gig you have to you know, play the, the, the songs you don't necessarily want to mm -hmm. play and then do it with enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. You know, there's kind of the, he repeats the same story mm -hmm. about the cat. There was a lot of depressing mm -hmm. shit in this movie. Mm -hmm. There's, yeah, so there's the, the repetition, the endless repetition as you're performing. Like he takes this terrible gig mm -hmm. for a telethon on channel 71 and it's at three o'clock in the morning and obviously nobody's watching. And then at one point the the telethon guy interrupts their performance mm -hmm. with, oh my God, we've hit a new milestone. And he loses it. Jack's Jack character loses it, loses yeah. it and he storms out and he obviously the gig's over and they have a fight out in the street. Mm -hmm. Total brother fight, mm -hmm. wrestling match. Yeah, I think I yelped at one point when he grabbed Frank's fingers as if to break them mm -hmm. and he didn't break them. Yeah, because it was a brother fight. So what we mean by brother fight is that... <laughs> They're kind of like childishly wrestling each other without the intention. You could tell that neither one really wants to hurt the other. And I've seen brothers fight like this. Yeah. It's really funny. But they're really, really angry at each other, right? Because there's so much shit to... There's there's a, um, there's 31 years yeah. in that scene where they're, uh -huh. when they're fighting each other. Yeah. And it's so realistic. Yeah, I thought the way that they dealt with these sibling issues. And again, this thing of kind of feeling held back. By, by your sibling. We had this conversation and I, it was a very serious conversation in which I said there are two types of gigs. One is the type of gig that you beg people for, right? You get hired by a hotel or a cafe or a restaurant and they dictate the terms. They tell you what to play and what not to play. You know, it's like, oh, can you play faster tempo to songs uh they tell you what to wear and then you're sort of performing to this crowd that doesn't give a shit and wants to be entertained in a very cheap way and then there's another type of performing that i sometimes do like once in a blue moon when i like have original material and i'm like it's more like a recital <laughs> and i get to play to an audience that really cares to hear so it's more like a concert. And I don't have fans, but, you know, some people do come and they want to listen to me and they want to listen to what I have written. I don't do that very often. I don't get to do that very often. But what I have stopped doing are the former type of gigs. Yeah, we talked about this. I And I was mm -hmm. shocked by some of the things you were saying mm -hmm. because I've never been told what to wear or what to play. Mm -hmm. even. I mean, I've, I've done a lot of professional gigging. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously the band leader has a set list and we rehearse that set list, but I've never had someone who hires a band. I think maybe they hire bands because based on singers and singers inadvertently become band leaders because a lot of these venues and these um, booking people, they hire bands based on singers. So they would reach out to a specific singer and it's the singer's job to hire the band, right? And so... They probably give this information to the singer and it probably never reaches the drummer, I think. Oh, that could be. I didn't mm -hmm. think of that. Yeah. 
Because there's no way in hell that all these singers want to sing the same songs. Have you thought about that? Well, I think in the bands that I've been, Uh because, you know, I did a lot of wedding gigs in San Francisco and bar mitzvahs and a lot of corporate gigs. But we always had our set that we knew we had a performance. We knew that these songs were going to kill it. We didn't want to play all those songs. Right. But we knew that these were the favorites. And, totally, and, and yeah. Like my, the guitar player in one of my bands, he said D-P-E, danceable, popular, and easy. Yes, yes. And he was 100% right about mm-hmm. that. Yeah. But, and again, I'm not getting the gigs. I'm the drummer. But I would have to ask my, my former band leaders. Well, like, for me, I don't think they've been asked to play certain songs. Maybe yeah. at a wedding or even a bar mitzvah. Maybe, Weddings, maybe yeah. um, you know, songs were asked to be like one or two. But not like, here's a, here's a list of songs you need, or well, here's what you have to wear. Yeah, no, it's not necessarily, here's a list of songs that you have to play. It's like, can you play, and then a specific artist, and a spe- another specific artist. See, this isn't the way it should be. It should be no, that there's enough so. diversity in bands that this is the band that I think is right for my club. Uh-huh, yeah, totally. That's the way it should be. But what I'm saying is, like, live music has become so scarce and competitive... That okay. it has I think this is this. what's changed. Yeah, it has come to this where venues and business people who have no taste, taste. in anything whatsoever, they, they don't get trust, to dictate. They don't trust the band to be professionals. They absolutely do not trust the band to be professionals. And I have been in this situation and I have, a, I think in Seoul, I have a reputation of being very difficult. Yes, I know. But <laughs> <laughs> I just don't want to do that because I don't have to. And I think it's mm-hmm. like my arrogance. I'm kind of like Jeff. Um, no, but Jack. It's, I don't think it is arrogance. I think that, again, we're talking about different levels of music mm-hmm. performance. And this movie kind of covers it all in very subtle ways, not very overt ways. But it's almost like it's going on in their thoughts that there's these different levels that for, I think, you and me as mm-hmm. as musicians, this is a concern mm-hmm. of ours, right? Mm-hmm. Someone who's hiring a band should hire the band because they are professionals, because they know that they don't have to do the genius thing, that they ha- don't have to do the, the artist, mm-hmm. you know, kind of meandering thing that takes you off of entertainment. Mm-hmm. We get it. Mm-hmm, totally. <laughs> we are entertainers. We get it that we have to entertain. We know we have to sell drinks. Mm-hmm. We know when we do a gig, we are there to sell drinks. We get mm-hmm. that. But it's it's almost like it seems like there's been a change to where club owners and bookers don't respect that we understand that. I think it might be a soul thing. It might be a very specific thing that has been starting, okay. been beginning to happen now. But I think the other thing that's happening yeah. is is it's like everything else in this world. And I'm sorry to go on this on this rant. I'll try to keep it short, but everything's been flattened out. Totally. It, it's the way it should be, again, is there should be a diversity of entertainment to help you sell drinks. Mm-hmm. There should be a variety of styles and a variety of bands within those styles that have different sets, different playlists, mm-hmm. different ways of doing it, different instrumentation. But I think what's happened in this kind of flattening out, you know, this lack of concern for differences Mm -hmm. and this real need for everything to just be the same and know exactly what you're getting and just do a cookie cutter thing Mm -hmm. i think that's what's happening i think that there's just a factory line kind of mentality that's happening Mm -hmm. with music performance Mm -hmm. and it shouldn't be that way there should be diversity so that you know there is room for the unexpected while you're selling drinks Mm -hmm. while you're entertaining i mean you know it's not my problem Like, I don't own a business yet, (laughs) and I'm not dependent on live performance to make a living. Whereas before, I think I used to take whatever gig. There was this scene right before the physical fight between the two brothers, and I will never forget this line. (laughs) Jack says to Frank, what, you just got used to kissing ass so much that now you like it? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Totally. And the thing is, I this is something that I've been thinking about a lot because I'm a freelancer, I'm a performer, and I'm a voiceover artist, and I work with clients, and I'm constantly trying to please people. And I think that's very important. That's a huge part of my job. I need to satisfy the clients, the agents, I Absolutely. need to satisfy everybody. And that will always remain important. And I understand that. And I that takes up a lot of my energy and a lot of my time. And that will never change as long as I'm in this business. But... There has to be some sort of line to this. That's what I'm saying. That's <laughs> that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. And so that reminded me, once you start kissing ass, you might start to like it. Yeah. And another thing is, my experience with clients 
is that when you start to accommodate to their demands, the demands never stop. Okay. So I think this is the flattening out that I'm talking mm -hmm. about. I think this is the ecosystem that's developed in mm -hmm. music performance. Because I think everybody's done that because everything's hyper competitive. Uh -huh. And if you want to play, you have to do this and then you lose the whole idea of play. Right. This is one of the reasons why I love playing in Busan. You know, In Busan, it, it seems like it's a very different scene from Seoul. You're not making money at it, but you're doing it for the joy of playing music. Totally. And you do whatever you want, and then people come. So this would be the second type that you're talking yes, about, but definitely. but on a lower scale. But we would get, you know, pretty good-sized crowds mm -hmm. and just love it if we're doing, you know, like some uh, Steve Kimmock and Radiohead and Miles Davis and the Beatles mm -hmm. and Wilco. You know, like, we don't have to do play that funky music, white boy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people out there respond to good music. But mm -hmm. they might not be the type of people who buy lots of liquor. Oh, I they that's they do in, so? in Busan. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a different thing. That's but, yeah. not like the corporate. I don't gig know is because different. I'm not a business person. So I but I have screamed at a business owner because he suggested that my band should get paid a certain amount. Like he said that he suggested that he was being generous with the very low pay that he was paying us because he play he pays his staff fifteen dollars an hour. Oh jeez. So we should be paid by the hour just oh, like his no, staff. No, no, no. That's when you say no. No, I screamed the hell out. I, yeah, like, good, good. This is how I got this reputation of being but very here's, difficult. Yeah, but here's but that's not difficult. Here's the problem. Other people are taking those gigs. Yeah. No, but the thing is, this is what I'm trying to say. I decided not to do that because there has to be a limit to the shit that you are willing to take. And when you take too much shit, you cease to become an artist, period. Exactly. Yeah. And that was the point of that whole movie, I feel like. I think like. so. Yeah. I think so. And it was done, yeah, again, through these three different characters and, and the dynamics between them, this nice kind of tension mm -hmm. that pulls out these ideas. It's yep. very much a, a movie about music. So you had asked me earlier, what do I remember from the movie? Yeah. And I remember Bo Bridges being kind of a jerk. And then the other thing I remember is Michelle Pfeiffer and the big scene that got all the talk, which was the Make and Whoopi mm -hmm. performance on New Year's Eve. That scene stuck out. She is one of the most astonishingly good-looking people I agree with I you. have ever seen in my life. And I think she w she's a great singer. Mm. There's something, there's a thing that Hollywood does that I really like sometimes. They feature these untrained but very emotional sing singing performances. Another one that comes to mind is like Amanda Seyfried in Mamma Mia, which you probably haven't seen. Never seen it. <laughs> But she's a little bit untrained. There's another one. Um, have you seen Shame? Shame? With Michael Fassbender. It's about a oh, sex Oh, right. I, I did hear about that, and I was interested in seeing that, but I never did see it. Well, his sister is played by Carrie Mulligan. Yep. Who's not a singer, but she plays a singer, a lounge singer in New York. Hmm. And she sings this rendition of New York, New York. And it was beautiful. But she's not a singer. Like, you could tell that, yeah. Yeah, we could, I mean, we could mention so many others. There's, um, what's his name? The um, the Darth Vader, Adam Driver. Yes. So he sang uh -huh. at the end of Marriage Story. Did you see Marriage Story? Oh, yeah, I did. Yeah. So that was kind of surprising. Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of these things. Gwyneth Paltrow did the song totally. with um, Huey Lewis. Uh-huh. Yeah. Cruising. Yeah. There's been a lot of there's been a lot I mean, of that we and could I go love on down it. the line. Yeah. And I love it. Every time I see it, I love it because there's something about the untrained actor who's actually kind of trained in singing, you know? Like they're not like normal people who don't sing at all. There there is a minimum amount of training required to do that kind of singing. Well, I imagine still. she did go through some training to yeah. do that. And but the other thing is that these are talented people mm -hmm. and they are performers and mm -hmm. they've probably done theater when they yeah. were kids and things yeah. like that. You know, a lot of these actors. Yeah. I will defer to your knowledge. I thought her singing was fine. It seemed to me like she was trained to perform this role. Right. It's very difficult to walk into a to a scene and do an audition. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about that audition scene. And she nailed it. She, to me, sounded 
inexperienced. Yes. She had a nice tonality to mm-hmm. her voice. Yeah. I think she, you know, she was on key, everything, mm-hmm. and I thought her performances were good. Some of the nuances of singing, mm-hmm. I didn't think were as good. But I'm, you know, I'm totally. I, it's no, just of something course. I'm thinking She's about. not a professional singer, right? And obviously. so, yeah, yeah. And so, I thought it actually worked for the film. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And I really like that kind of singing sometimes because it reminds me of the storytelling. It's right. crucial to the storytelling. And in this context, her singing was perfect because she wasn't a singer before she showed up at that audition. Right. She was probably kind of singing in the shower and just like singing, practicing by herself. I wish we had gotten into her character a little more. Mm-hmm. We didn't really get any background of her character. Mm-hmm. There was no background of any character. That's actually. why there was a manic pixie dream girl yeah, element right. to that. Yeah, right. I was thinking the same yeah. thing. But in that sense, I think it was very, very... It had a lot of pathos. True. Yeah, and, and it had that. So it was kind of perfect the way it worked. Oh, totally. What else about the performances do we think? I think that the piano performances were really realistic Somebody we, knew exactly mm. what they were doing. We should mention that Dave Grusin, mm-hmm. who's who was really big in the eighties, I think. I don't I don't know too much about him. I know his name. He was involved in the music on this. I, mm-hmm. I'm guessing he probably did the piano. I'm not sure. So that was the musical performance. There's also the nine diegetic music, the score, and that I thought was kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, it was very 1989. Yeah. In that you know it's like something dramatic happens cue the saxophone <laughs> as they're walking down yeah. you know the dark alley by the way and there's like, there's a big film near film noir kind of element to this movie as well yeah. i thought of it as kind of like a film noir but without all the crime yeah. everything's drenched in a kind of reverb but not too much reverb <laughs> it had a dick tracy feel to it a little bit yeah yeah so a film noir kind of thing going on yeah i mean there was some soprano saxophone mm-hmm. which was kind of a product of the time. But I remember also during this time and, and being 20 years old during this time, this was a time of a lot of films, I think, trying to do this, trying to re-explore jazz and the value of jazz because I think jazz had all kinds of problems in the late uh, 80s. What is jazz anyway? Well, I mean, there, yeah. uh, jazz is a, is a, an aesthetic. It's a feeling. Yeah. It's, a, it's an attitude. Mm-hmm. It's a mood. But I think it had, like, jazz had fallen into this terrible kind of grm records kind of fusion situation Mm. where you had chick korea's electric band which sorry Mm. was kind of terrible and a lot of these fusion guitar players no i think chick korea is great but this was not a good time yeah you know like i'm just i'm picking on grm records but john schofield yeah 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 yeah. i love john schofield i do too like um we all love these people, but I, I think I know what you're so saying. So the late yeah. '80s kind of yeah, kind yeah. of trapped a lot of a lot of these people, mm-hmm. and it has that sound. But also at the same time, there's a sound to it that I really like, and I mm-hmm. could see the emergence of the '90s. Like I could hear kind of a David David Sylvian kind of mm-hmm. thing happening, where you know David Sylvian is not really jazz, but he pulls in these jazz elements and these experimental music elements. And I can kind of, you know, Uh he's got an album called uh, Gone to Earth, which I think came out in 1990 or 89, maybe actually. And it had that kind of sound Uh to it and kind of of this drenched, very atmospheric feel to it. So I thought the soundtrack was interesting, but it was very, it's a little bit dated. It's very specific. It is very specific. And now it's cool because it's so specific. Anything that's Mm. very specific and is from like, 30 years ago is cool now. I think you might have hit on what is cool, actually. Uh-huh, yeah. Being what cool is, is being specific. Yeah, totally. I'm going to have to think but about it, that. But it has to be like very dated, though, because it can't be like specifically 2018, you know, <laughs> like something that, yeah. like, it has to be very, very specifically. Yeah. Uh, you have to get the details right. Right. Because it's like you're trying to be authentic, but you can't mm-hmm. be authentic because it's a thing of the past. Yeah. You just quote well. Yes. Sight well. Yes. Movies about music. Oh, so we were talking about the piano scene, um, the New Year's Eve gig scene. So for those who haven't seen this movie and don't know what we're talking about, um, the really famous scene from that movie is Michelle Pfeiffer. Oh, right. Yeah, Let's Susie Diamond. Yeah. So Frank has to go home for some reason for a family emergency. And so... Susie and Jack end up doing a New Year's gig together Mm -hmm. as a duo. And she is singing on top of the piano in a red dress, right? Oh, my God, that scene was wonderful. It was. That was was a beautiful scene. And it was, was, you know, the the chemistry between them Mm -hmm. two is 
exactly. fantastic. It was fantastic. It was beautiful. She was yeah. absolutely like, oh my gosh, she was gorgeous. And the sound, right? They they had the sound of the room. They showed the audience a little bit mm -hmm. and how entranced they were. Yeah. And this was a time when people actually went to gigs and they listened to the music. They sh they went for the show, right? right? They weren't just like background performers. Mm -hmm, and, yeah, mm -hmm. the dress, the the jewelry that was like sparkling and everything. Mm -hmm. It was just absolutely stunning. Again, I was noticing Jeff Goldblum. What? Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> Jeff I was Bridges. noticing Jeff. <laughs> I was noticing Jeff Bridges. You know, like he's doing his thing. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And there's always this thing with, you know, like pianists and singers or mm -hmm. guitarists and singers, mm -hmm. men and women mm -hmm. playing together. The eye contact thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he doesn't look at her. Mm -hmm. And he's just cool as hell. Mm -hmm. And then at one point, you know, she sort of grabs him and makes him look at her. Yeah, yeah. And then he looks at her and mm -hmm. smiles. It just sort of caught the chemistry that was also happening throughout the film. Mm -hmm where they were attracted to each other, mm -hmm. but didn't want to pursue that. Mm -hmm. It was a very old school 1950s sort of romance mm -hmm. kind of yeah. tension. It was yeah. really nice. Yeah, it was. It was It was cute. Yeah. <laughs> we should say, we should say that Jack's character, again, is kind of a dick. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He had, well, he has moments, and, but it's very realistic in that way. Of course, yeah. you know, musicians are like this. He's very grumpy. Creative people are like this. Again, I think he's entirely different from the kid in Whiplash, for example. Oh, absolutely. I know a lot of people who are this grumpy and this brilliant, and they scare the heck, the heck out of me. I think Nietzsche said something about Lou Andrea Salome, who was a, mm. who was a woman that he was in love with, mm -hmm. but she was, you know, in her own kind of world and he said something like we have to grant permission to those who are very gifted mm -hmm. you know for their foibles yeah because they're giving us the gift of their fragility or something like that i forget the yeah exact I, I i totally i think i get it um i actually agree because there is something there is a courage a level of you know just courage and abandon abandon that you yes. need in order to truly be an artist and stick to who you are yeah you because, have to abandon appearances you have to yeah. let that you have to let that shield go yeah and that's what art is that's what being an artist is it's I agree. being true to yourself yeah i agree i'm not and sometimes it's not pretty right exactly i'm i don't think of myself as an artist yet because i haven't abandoned anything i am like mm. desperately holding on to what people think about me and mm -hmm. my career and i'm kind of like frank right now at this point in my life no i don't th i don't agree. I, I really think that i'm a frank and this past year i have totally been a i frank. think this is how yeah. you're feeling over the past two years because of the pandemic i've seen performances of you in the past and i've seen videos of you and heard your music you are an artist mm -hmm. i disagree with you i mm -hmm. think this year and last year have maybe sort of kind of shaken our sense of confidence in being an artist mm. because of every, everything so under the microscope right now. Mm -hmm. And everything seems to be, it seems to be those who market themselves and those who hustle are the ones who are gaining the attention. It's survival angst. Yeah. I definitely have been motivated by my own survival angst. And that was like my only motivation for doing anything. That's how I've spent the past two years but i was watching it and i was thinking yeah you know there has to be a line somewhere an artist needs to be dignified no matter what in what he believes in okay. and i think that's part of being an artist mm. as opposed to a craftsperson and i know i totally I, I really believe this there is something you know you got to stick with what's true to you so any closing thoughts i just really enjoyed it um yeah. and i thought it was something that i that i really needed to see to wash myself of whiplash <laughs> the director of this film steve cloves yes he only directed two films and then he's done a bunch of script mm -hmm. writing i can see the love for music that he put oh totally into this movie. yeah i absolutely agree with you yeah which really helped me wash whiplash away from my soul <laughs> yes i think yeah i feel cleansed and reborn <laughs> watching this movie yeah <laughs> And then next time, mm -hmm. in two weeks, we are going to watch this movie that we've been putting off. Oh, finally, The yeah. Double Life of Veronica. Yeah, and I don't even know if it's a movie about music. It's I, a movie it about is. music teachers. It but it's going to be like. weird, I think. Yeah, I think it's going to be weird, too. And I'm looking forward to it because we mm -hmm. recently watched some Koslowski films. Yeah. 
Rouge and we watched Blanc. Yeah. And I liked Rouge. Um, uh, Blue is my favorite. But yeah. we, we can get into yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. And Irene Jacobs, the heroine uh, of Rouge, yes. is going to be the main character, plays the main role in La Double Vie de Véronique. Yes. So that will be next time. Until then, again, we would really appreciate it if you could help us by leaving a review mm -hmm. or following our Instagram, which is... And following the podcast. Yeah, following yeah. the podcast. Yeah, our Instagram is at Movies About Music. Yeah, and we'll do some previews and you can... Mm -hmm. Do some discussion there if you'd like. Mm -hmm. And until then, have a happy new year. Yes. What do you want to give to the listeners as we head into the new year? Let's tread carefully and go gently into the new year. Ooh, mm -hmm. I like it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go in burning. Mm, of course you are. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. All right. Thanks, everybody. Ciao. Happy new year. Yep. Bye-bye. Under the moonlight, I'll sing you a song. So you'd magically feel a lot less alone Hopefully they'll live eternally If we paint ourselves all bright with stories Of heroes and poets and sadness and war Of immeasurable pain, unconditional love Movies about music